would you say you've done that? About three? Oh, more, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what in that little That's bit? What I'm uh, not. Probably about yeah. five or six. We, we, did, we, had two, we had two weeks where you, you did good. one verse, I think, and I yeah. think I did two verses, and last week you did two verses. Yeah. So there's just been a few I'm where we've concentrated. Half a verse. <laughs> 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 yeah, I could do slightly more than that. Anyway, um, right. So we're at two Corinthians chapter two, and tonight we're going to do verse fourteen to, and including v- verse seventeen. So verse uh, fourteen to verse seventeen. Matthew, would you mind reading that verse, please? Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ, in them that are saved, <clears throat> and in them that perish. To the one we are the savour of death unto, life, uh, unto death, and to the other the savour of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, we've had a few um, verses that we looked at that have been quite complicated, you know, quite sort of difficult to understand almost really what's being said. But this is probably, I would say, more, more simple to understand really what, what Paul is saying here. And so rather than have a big long introduction as you know now we can see what's happening in Corinth and all this I just want to go for the verses tonight and just say you know what is he talking about what's he saying well first of all he starts in verse 14 and I want to just spend a little while on this one it says now thanks be unto God which always causeth us to triumph just stop there for a minute Mm. so God always causes you to triumph mm-hmm. yes you're all you're always victorious whatever comes your way whatever challenge whatever temptation god always according to paul always causes us to triumph you you you, you win every time you never lose you, you every time you're tempted you always overcome it is is that true is that hands up if that's everybody's experience all the time oh well, good man yes no. No. perhaps but then again Perhaps not. Perhaps that is not every time. Whilst whilst we would like it to be every time, how come it isn't every time? You know, how come when we look back over our lives, I mean, there may be times where you're triumphing, but a lot of the time it seems to be, you know, fail, 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 triumph, fail, 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 triumph. You know, it, it, a lot of times you think, I say, hang on a minute, I seem to be failing more times than I'm actually triumphing here. And yet Paul says that God always causes us to triumph. So how can we, how can we uh, uh, reconcile that? Let me give you an illustration. I've got a friend, a person that I know, who, um, who I guess you would say made a commitment to Christ, whatever that means, um, and, and his life is a total mess, right? And so we were talking one day and I said, look... Uh, why do you think, you know, if, if you're a Christian, why do you think your life is such a mess then? You know, because I'm nice like that. But, <laughs> but, but I, I, I thought, you know, what's the point in just pretending? So I just said, look, you know your life's a mess. I know it is. If you're a Christian, why do you think your life's like that? And he said, well, God sets tests for people, right, to test your faith. Mm. So I said, okay. And he said, and I failed every one of them. So that was his answer. You see, but according to Paul, yes, if God, if we accept that God does allow tests to come along, put it that way, of our faith, but according to Paul, God always causes us to triumph. What part did I leave out there? God always causes us to triumph in Christ, and that's the big difference. That's the difference. If you're in Christ and you remain in Christ, then yes, God will always cause you to triumph. But the point is that we quite often we don't remain in Christ. We 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 follow our own flesh 
uh, let's just have a look for a moment. Um, John 15. Go to John 15. <laughs> John 15 and um, verse 4. Verse 4. And these are the words of Jesus. And he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So the picture is of a vine. Christ says, I'm the vine, and you're the branches that are coming off that vine. Now, if you cut that branch off and lay it to one side, it's not going to produce any fruit. Because it's not drawing up the sap, it's not drawing up the goodness that comes from the vine. You have to be in the vine. The word abide means you, when you abide somewhere, you, you, you live there. And I always use this illustration, you know, you think of that saying, welcome to my humble abode. And when we came in here to that, maybe Matthew or Charlotte might have felt like saying, come, to, come into my lovely abode. Well, that's where you live, your abode. And so Christ ought to be your abode. You ought to abide in him. You ought to make your home in Jesus Christ. And he says, and I abide in you. In other words, Christ comes when you become a Christian. He comes and he makes his home within you. And he dwells there and he lives there. Uh, and so that's the picture here. And so if we continue to abide in Christ and he continues to abide in us, then God will always cause us to triumph. But the problem is that the flesh... Is so strong, isn't it? That's the problem. Our flesh is very uh, powerful. It's very strong. But here's a question for you. Are you feeding your flesh? Are you actually making it stronger with the lifestyle that you lead? So there are certain things that our flesh wants. For example, your flesh might say, right, I, I, I want to eat. I want to eat something. I want to eat more. I want to eat uh, to excess. That's what your flesh wants. Now, it's not wrong to eat, obviously. But, but if you want to eat to excess, that's sin. You know, that, that is, the Bible calls it riotous eating or gluttony. And so that is of the flesh. So if your body says, right, I want food, do you say, oh, all right, then better eat something. Oh, I, want, I, I want that McDonald's. I want to drive in here then and get, and, and get one. You know, do you always give your flesh what it wants when it demands it? Or you might say, right, uh, right I'm going to bed now. Oh, can you just stop a minute? No, I'm, I'm tired. I've got to go. You, know, you feel tired. I'm going to go to sleep because that's what my flesh wants. You know, uh, and there are other, uh, uh, other examples we could give. Your flesh wants to get angry. So you just let it all out. You know, you don't try and control that. I think, well, well that wouldn't be right. You know, and this is where part of the problem comes, I think, is in the Christian life, face many different challenges, and if you're used to just letting your flesh have its way, whatever that is, you know, whether it's uh, uh, gluttony, whether it's lust, whether it's whatever, you know, then, and you don't try and, try and temper that, then the flesh gets stronger. It, it, it gets into this position where actually, it's not you running your life, it's your flesh. So like, yeah, I'll go to the meeting unless, you know, I, I, don't, I don't feel feel up to it or I don't, I don't feel like going today or somebody's, you know, really ticked me off today and therefore I'm not going to go. Well, who's running your life, your flesh or you? You know, and, and so this is one of the reasons actually why Christians practice the discipline of fasting, right? It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons is because your flesh says, right, I want to eat now. And you say... No, you're not going to. Yeah, you know, we're just. I'm just going to drink water or whatever it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I want to eat something, and you're saying, and I'm saying, no, you're not. And so it, it becomes where your you, your soul, is actually in the controlling position, not your flesh. You're just not at the whim of your your, your flesh. And see how that works. Yeah, you, 
by depriving your flesh of these things, by saying no to your flesh, it ceases to be in such a strong position. That doesn't mean you will never fall, but what it means is that, that you know you get used to saying no to your flesh. And that's important for a Christian. Because the Christian life involves discipline, discipline doesn't it? It involves uh, training. And so that's how we, we continue to triumph in, in Christ, is to abide in him. Uh, we continue to not walk in the flesh, but walk in the spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.17 says, Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Um, so it's a form... It's a form of training, it's a form of discipline that, that Christians have to practice. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I have to say, it's easier to say than actually do, you know. It's sometimes you just think, ah, just... Yeah, we're all, uh, you know, as, as Matthew touched on the other week, we, you know, our soul, our spirit and our body are all interconnected and we all feel what it's like to be in a body, you know, we all get hungry, we all get mm, thirsty, and, and so on. So I, I have every sympathy with people, but this is really important to understand, there's a discipline to the Christian life, and you're just going to fail sooner or later, unless you embrace that discipline. Alright, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 24, Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, and as they all run, but one receiveth the prize. Sorry, where are we? Uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians yeah. you get that? 9, 24. Yeah. Yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, so it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. In other words, he, he has self-control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or should be reprobate one whom God has rejected. So what, what's he saying? He's saying, look, here's an example of what I'm talking about. When you see people running in a race, everybody runs, but only one person's going to win that top prize. Only one person's going to come at, at, at the, the head who's going to win it. And so he says, in your Christian walk, in your Christian life, train yourself like a runner. Make sure you're the one that gets to the line. For you know, Have that mentality. I'm going to win. I'm going to win the prize. Have that determination and put in the training, put in the study, put in the prayer, put in the spending time with God. Because, you know, often, you know, you look at athletes and people who get to the top of the game. Yes, there might be a natural, you know, skill there somewhere, an actual predisposition, just a, what would you call it, a gift for something. But often it's the amount of work they've put in, you know. They train harder than everybody else. They work harder. They're the ones who are, you know, who were, who were, anyway, you know what I'm saying. It's like being a professional Christian almost, isn't it? You know, being, in a way. You know what I mean? You yeah, know, support, being, being, being taken it as... Um, well, you've got to take it seriously. As, as a professional, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it's awesome. your life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you I eat, like sleep, and it's natural. Like yeah. someone could have a natural talent for someone, but it's yeah. like... If you were put in the worst place to become a Christian, that's yeah. like your natural talent because you're you. So if you're in the middle of nowhere, yeah. how can you get in front of someone who's in the w worst place in the world who are preaching and getting rocks yeah. thrown at them yeah. and getting put in prison and still preaching and still preaching, whereas someone might not be brought, be close to that, mm -hmm. so they won't have that natural surrounding as the mm -hmm. person who suffers most persecution but it is like sort of Paul travelled in it to get there sort of thing do you know if you're not willing to put your life down like that you're not I was you seeing you mean so like you mean if, you, if you're in a persecuted place with persecution they've got more of the advantage like you think there's an advantage there because you're under that assault mm -hmm. and so therefore the more 
the more of your oh, Christianity will come out. Yes, yeah. yes. So you have to that's that's true. But also, in Acts 17, it says that God has decided the, the, the places where, you know, the boundaries yeah. and the time that you live in. So God puts the right people in the right places. Mm. And so sometimes the trials and tests that we go through whilst we're not having rocks thrown at us, well, not, not generally, uh, in this country, there may be other, other things. There may be other temptations like money. You know, and affluence and, and yeah. what, whatever. Yeah. I'm not saying we've got it harder than they have, but what I'm saying is it's all relative. And the point is, however easy it is or whatever, you still have to put the training in. And, and Paul says, you know, uh, he also talks about verse 26, you know, run not as uncertainly, but, you know, aim for the line, go for the line. And he says, you know, I fight like a boxer, not as one that beats the air, but I'm training. I'm putting myself in training here. And, you know, he said they do it to get a corruptible crown. If you were an athlete in those days and, 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 and you won a race, you would get like a laurel crown, you know, instead of a medal. And that would be your mm. sign that you'd come first. Great. He said, and he's saying they'll work so hard just to get that little crown mm. they can put on the head. Mm. And he says it's corruptible. The leaves will all perish. It'll all just, you know, eventually it'll just become dry leaves and there'll be nothing. He said, but we're working for, for an incorruptible uh, crown, one that won't perish. And so he's saying if they work that hard to be the top of their game, we should be working even harder for something that's eternal and training ourselves. And he says, in verse 27, I keep my body, so I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection so that's saying you know i i make sure that my flesh my body is not in control of me but rather i am in control of it going back to what we read at first in christ because that's the that's the key you can't do it unless you're in christ unless you're abiding in him remaining in him yeah. and allowing him to remain in you because that's where strength is and i i mean i I'll only touch on this tonight because I can't, we just haven't got the time to go into it. We probably will at some point. But I think really it will always be a struggle. It will always be winning sometimes, losing sometimes. And I hate saying it's inevitable, you see, because I don't think it is. But it, I think, this is just what I think, I think it will always be difficult until you are entirely sanctified. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think entire sanctification is the key yeah. to this. And we haven't got time to go into what that is now. Yeah. But, but you know, look it up. So, well, I did preach a bit on it in, in times yeah. past. But, but read, read Wesley and people like that. Entire sanctification is the key to this. I'm convinced more and more about that. Yeah. But anyway, let, let, let's get on and let's deal with the, um, the verses that we've got tonight. So... Three things, really, that, that we need to observe. One, abide in Christ. Make your home in Christ. Mm -hmm. Two, learn to deny yourself. To take up your cross daily. Get used to denying yourself and not just giving your flesh what it wants. And three, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfil the lust of the flesh. It, it, it's what's been called um, victorious living. Mm -hmm. And the implication... Um, from these verses, sometimes verses and, and, and in the original language will imply certain things. Uh, and so the picture here that we have in 2 Corinthians, just flip back to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, uh, is of a triumphal procession, right? So you're, you're, you're victorious, uh, you, you're always being caused to triumph, and uh, the, the picture is of this, this triumph. So, so everybody can see you in that respect. Everybody can see your life. And that's how they know you're, um, you're triumphant. It's something that's witnessed by others. Uh, something that is before God, but it's also before other men. And um, James says... James 2.24 says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Mm. This sounds like an odd kind of verse to visit, but it, it is very relevant to this because a lot of people will read that and say, that can't be right. <laughs> what? Justified by works? I thought, I thought Paul says we're justified by faith. Therefore being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 1. How do you reconcile that? James is saying we're justified by works. Paul in Romans 5 1 is saying we're justified by faith. This is the answer, okay? Before God, we're justified by faith alone because God sees the heart. Before men, we're justified by our works because that's what they see. Because they can't see your heart. That's why James talks about, yeah, you, show, you say you've got faith. Well, I'll show you my faith by what I do, by my works. Right. And so this is the, the context or this is the implication of the words we've been looking at in 2 Corinthians. Is here is a person in a triumphal procession. It's a triumphal procession of the victor. And one of the things that they used to do, in, in particularly in the Middle East and so on at this time, was as you were, you were the victor and you were marching through the streets with this great procession, they would light incense. Yeah? And, and the, incense, the smoke from the incense would waft amongst the crowds and people would be able to, to smell it and, and, and you can smell it coming up. Here he comes now, here he is. The crowd will be cheering and they yeah, yeah, I can smell the incense. He's coming, he's coming. And then they'd see him and he'd go past and the incense would just, would just kind of linger. And what Paul is saying is something quite interesting here. It's almost sort of poetic. But he says, in the end of verse 14 there, he says, uh, uh, Now thanks be to God which always causes us us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest or, or it makes obvious or apparent the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. Now the savour is if you like the odour or the smell just like the smell of that incense and Paul is saying look it, it, when we triumph it's like it's like almost like the smell of the knowledge of God. He's getting a bit poetic here really with us but he's saying that knowledge of God is like a smell that, that, that lingers and he says, for we are unto God a sweet savour, a sweet smell of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savour of death unto death and to the other the savour of life unto life. So what's that saying? He's saying that when we're obedient to Christ, when, when we triumph in God, uh, we are to God the sweet savour of Christ with the same with the same odour if you like for one of a word to those who are being saved or to those who are perishing this is the same smell but it has a different effect upon people so when we come with, with, with our triumph in Christ with our knowledge of Christ which is what it's saying in other words the gospel to some the smell of that is something sweet and to others it's something foul. I mean, uh, this is a bit of a, a, a cockeyed illustration, but uh, the other day I was walking through Stockport and you could smell that someone had been, been smoking marijuana. You know, I mean, it's really pungent, isn't it, now? The smells of it. And the people weren't there anymore. They'd gone. But the smell was still there. And I was walking through there and I was thinking, oh, that stinks, because I know what it is. But to other people, they'd be walking through going... Oh yeah, I could do some of that, you know. They're, they're like, they're, to them, it's a sweet smell. Now, I'm not comparing Christ to marijuana, but what I'm saying is, it's, it's the same smell, isn't it? But it affects two different sorts of people in a different way. And it's the same with the gospel. If you want salvation, if you're seeking God and you hear the gospel, you think, why is that wonderful sweet smell? It's Christ. It's the knowledge of God. It's sweet to me. But if you don't want Jesus Christ, if you don't, you think, oh, what's this horrible, mm. horrible, you know, preaching? I can't mm. stand it. It's almost like, oh, it makes me sick. You know, it's an extreme uh, uh, illustration of, of, of what it is, isn't it? But that's, that's what the gospel, what the knowledge of, of how does it put it? Uh, the savour of his, that is Christ's knowledge, is like that to people. And... Those who to those who refuse it, it, it is it is an offensive smell, and it will lead them from death to death, from spiritual death to what the Bible calls the second death. That was a lead to their eternal destruction. You know they're already dead in their trespasses and sins. Uh, it says in Ephesians, I think. Uh, so they will. It will lead them on to what the Bible calls the second death in the lake of fire. But to those. 
who, uh, who, who, who have life, well, for those who are seeking life, it will bring spiritual life to them, and that spiritual life will lead them on to eternal life. So it's from life to life. Um, so, coming down now then to the next, uh, to the end of that verse, and who is sufficient for these things, Paul says. So who, you know, this, this is a great responsibility, isn't it? To take something which is to some people death and to other people life. What a great weighty uh, responsibility. Who is sufficient to, to be able to take a message like that, to be able to take that, that odour, if you like, that, that, to train for this and then to have the responsibility of that. Who's sufficient? Well, well no one's sufficient. That was the whole point of the fir first verse that we read there. Only God is sufficient. Yeah, and that's and that's really, uh, really what is being said here. It, it is actually God who is sufficient. He is our sufficiency, isn't he? By abiding in Christ, then he becomes uh, the the sufficiency. Verse verse seventeen, the last verse there. Uh, Paul then says, "For we are not as many." which corrupt the word of God. You know, he says, uh, when, we, when we take the word of God out, we've not, we've not corrupted it. And again, there is, a, there is a sense or a meaning behind that word corrupt. Uh, uh, another word you could put there would be adulterate. And um, the picture is of, a, um, what do you call it, like a, a dishonest merchant. So, for example, in those days when they used to sell wine, uh, you, you wouldn't get just wine in your bottle. There'd be wine, a bit of watering down going on there. You know, add a few other things to it. So, so you, you know, they're trying to kind of slip one past you. They're mixing it with other things. And Paul says, uh, we don't corrupt the word of God. In other words, we don't mix it with something else. We don't water it down. So when you come to us and you hear us preach, Paul's saying you get it's pure. You get the pure word of God. It's not. It's not mixed with something else, you know. It's not to make it more palatable to you or to make it go further. We're just going to mix it with something. No, he so said, it, it's pure what you're hearing. It's absolutely pure. And the sincerity of the gospel uh, is, is also, it's not, it's not watered down. They're not trying to pull a fast one on you. They're not charlatans. You know, and unfortunately, in, in particularly in the West today, there are many people who are corrupt in the Word of God. There are many people deliberately watering it down, deliberately taking the edges off it. Well, there's still people nowadays, you know, they not very. It demands a lot of them. We'll just water it down a little bit, not quite as harsh. Well, you know, and then and then we say, well, how come the Apostle Paul was so did so amazingly well? How come you know had such an impact in his life? Well, because he took the pure gospel out. He didn't take something that was that was watered down out, you know. Um, so it, 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 it's of God. In fact, let me just have a look. As if I can remember. I just, the reason I'm pausing there, there's a verse that I read today. I'm not quite sure where it is. It's in Ecclesiastes. And I looked at it in a way that I'd never really, never really thought about it before. And maybe it just kind of ties in a little... I'm going to edit this out. If I can't find it, I'll have to edit it out. Uh, well, Leather looks stupid, aren't I? It's about 9 or 11. Um, yeah, it's 11. It's 11. Okay, so... What, what, what book is it? Ecclesiastes. Oh, is it? Oh, is that that one we left? Was in? No, it's Yeah. Yeah. It's got all the names on it. Yeah, it's the one with the... What, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chapter 11. Mm. Chapter 11. Mm. And it's, like a lot of Ecclesiastes, it's written in a slightly poetic style, but... I'll kind of, I'll just deal with the, the relevant pieces of scripture here. So it says, cast thy bread upon the waters. Okay, the picture here is someone casting bread out 
on the water. Stick with me. All will become clear in a moment, hopefully. Okay. Verse 3. Uh, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. So, if a cloud's got something that's full of rain, the rain comes out, doesn't it? And, and it, it goes on the dry land, or it goes on farmland, or it goes wherever, doesn't it? It just it just goes. When, when it's ready for the cloud to drop its rain, it just lands on whatever kind of uh, uh, ground there is. Uh, he that observeth the wind, verse 4 shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. So if you're there looking, then, oh, well, you know, the clouds don't look quite right. It's not really the right kind of day. I think it's very going to be a very good day for sowing today. So better not sow, and, you know, um, because this is the key now, verse 5, as thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow. In the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Now, why, why is this relevant? Okay, the first picture is someone casting their bread out in the water. They're just chucking it there, chucking it out there. The next picture is a clouds coming along. That they're full of rain. They just let the rain go, and that's it. And it goes. Sometimes it goes on dry land, dusty land, where nothing grows. Other times it grows on farmland, and, and you see, you know, great produce. Um, if you stand there worrying about, well, you know, should I preach the gospel here? Is it really right? I don't think there's very much of a response here. Well, then what's the point of doing it? Nobody ever listens over here. Maybe if it's in another country, maybe they listen there. You know, if you're out preaching the gospel, you think of stuff like this. You know, well, well maybe it's the, maybe Stockport or maybe it's... But here's the, the key, verse 5, and it, it ties in with what we're looking at really tonight. Um, As thou knowest not... What is the way of the Spirit? You don't know what the Spirit of God is doing in people's hearts. Yeah? You don't even know how a body comes together in the womb and how God makes it all knit together, but he does it. And and it's hidden, isn't it? You can't, I mean, now we have like, you know, ultrasound, not ultrasound, what they're called, scans and all that kind of stuff. But he's saying, you don't really know how all that stuff works, but God does. And you can't see, in other words, thou knowest not the works of God who make a fall. So that, that's what it comes down to. You know, when you preach the gospel, when you share it, just do it. If you've got it, then like those clouds full of rain, then let the rain out. You know, if you've got the word, then give it and let God worry about how it's going to be done because you and I, we, we, we don't know how it's done. God knows how to do it and uh, it's our responsibility to just give it. So, okay, 2 Corinthians, just finishing off now. Uh, so Paul's saying we don't corrupt the word of God we don't change it for our society that we live in more with people and well they won't really understand that if I say repent nobody will understand what that means use the words of Christ expound them talk about them this is what it means okay but don't use different words yeah don't, don't, don't use a different way of the gospel preach the gospel preach the word that's what it says isn't it preach the word in season or out season if it's fashionable or unfashionable if people are listening if the ground is barren or whether you're seeing fruit preach it anyway and preach it but as of God verse 17 towards the end there saying because preach it knowing that these words are of God they're not of us and in the sight of God we speak in other words God is listening God's hearing what you're saying about his word he knows when you try and Mm, well, I won't, but not say that because I might get offended. He knows. He's listening. How are you going to say his word? What are you going to say? If you know it, are you going to be preaching in sincerity like Paul, or are you just trying to, you know, water it down a bit, mix it in with something else, or is it pure? Is it the pure word? In the sight of God, speak we again. It finishes off quite nicely in Christ. He's just reminding you in case you forgot what was said there in verse uh, verse fourteen that you're only going to triumph if you're in Christ and you're only going to be successful with the gospel if you're doing it that's of God, witnessed by God and it's in Christ, you're doing it from the Spirit, from, from you know. All right.